Okay. Hello and welcome to Freelove's first vet live Q&A session. Um, thank you for sending in your questions about all your dogs. Um, we've got, uh, we'll try and get through a lot, as many as we can. Um, we've got medic animals, vets with us to help us answer your questions. Um, so, over to you. Um, hello there. Uh, we're, number one, really excited about doing this. Uh, we very much hope that uh, we'll be able to do many more in the future. Thank you very much for sending uh, your questions through. It's uh, very much appreciated. Um, my name is Andrew. Um, and this is Emma, and we both work for, for Medic Animal. Uh, we're both veterinarians and have been working here for the last three, uh, three years or so. Um, the first really important thing to say is that we're obviously not your particular vet, so we don't know your animal specifically in terms of being able to do a physical exam. We're not able to answer you questions directly to hear the answers. So that's a little bit tricky, but the important thing is that we are here to give good general advice about common issues with animals, but ultimately, um, if there is something specific, um, you will need to see, and we'll, we'll answer that, you will need to see your vet, because your vet, he or she will then have to do probably a physical exam, ask you the questions, take, uh, take some bloods or whatever else is required in order to have some idea of what is going on with your vet. Um, but we're here to at least see whether your animal needs to see a vet in the short term anyway. So, let's start. Okay. So our first question is from Sue. She says, I have a six-year-old rescued toy poodle that won't eat dog food, uh, wet food or dry. He will only eat fish, cat food. Is there any other supplements she can give him? <laughs> oh dear. So this is a, quite a common problem, especially in poodles. Um, they do tend to be a little bit fussy um, and they do tend to know how to um, get their owner to do what they want, basically. They're smart, they're smart dog, basically. Yeah. So, um, so it sounds like your dog is um, had quite a good deal at getting some really tasty food, uh, tasty cat food, tasty human food. Um, and the thing about cat food is that because cats tend to be fussier than dogs, is that they do make it very, very tasty. Um, they put a lot of flavouring, salt, fat, all that sort of thing. Um, unfortunately, in the long term, it's not so good for a dog to, to only eat cat and human food, um, just because the nutritional composition is not really ideal for dogs, it's a bit rich. Um, <clears throat> especially with poodles, uh, they can tend to have teeth problems. They certainly can, <laughs> yeah. Yes, we've seen a few of those. Um, so, so if, if your wee dog is, is really only eating soft food, um, their teeth aren't doing a lot of work and that can cause problems down the track. Mm -hmm. um, so what we would suggest is that you know you do actually try and, and make the switch back to dog food. Um, by doing that you do have to be a little bit cruel to be kind. Um, but the easiest, most painless way is probably to start um, integrating some dog food in with the cat food, mixing it up and then gradually increasing the ratio of, of dog to cat food until um, you've just got the dog food. Yeah. Um, fortunately, we've got some really tasty dog food. Yeah, foods. there's some new ones. Like you, mentioned, you mentioned that you've tried a few dog foods in the past. Um, obviously, we don't know which ones, but there are some new foods that have come onto the market which are sort of organic or more responsibly sourced and um, have, uh, have done very well and we've seen a lot of success. Um, one of them notably is called Lily's Kitchen. Um, I know that's had a very good uptake amongst, uh, let's call them the fussier eaters <laughs> out there. Um, and as Emma says, I mean, it's, you know, you've got to just give it a go um, and, and persevere with it. If, if, if you're not going to eat it straight away, then, you know, you take the food away, you don't leave it there and get all old and dry because I wouldn't want to eat that, I'm sure you wouldn't. Uh, so you take it away and then you bring it back in. And as I said, you know, we said you bring in a little bit of, in this case, let's call it Lily's Kitchen, and first day, maybe do one quarter Lily's Kitchen, three quarters of your cat food, give it a good mix. Um, sometimes it helps even to warm up the food ever so gently because that releases some of the flavors and makes it easier, more, makes it more palatable, more palatable and a bigger stimulus to eat. And, and then from that, you then gradually, literally over a period of a week, um, start introducing more and more of the new dog food um, and reducing the amount of cat food. And generally, you'll find uh, that over a one to two week progression, 
uh, you will uh, you will have the meeting um, the correct balance diet. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Thank you. Um, okay, our next question is from Jackie. I have a five and a half year old Tibetan Mastiff along the Kundam and another. Her name is Yasmin. She was spayed at just over a year old and has recently started to leak urine while sleeping. I've had her on homeopathic leave no more drops. Any yeah. other device? <laughs> um, she's over a year old, she's been spayed and she's leaking um, a bit of urine. Um, the most common cause of this is, is, uh, is a weakened sphincter of the bladder, uh, mostly the internal sphincter. Um, it's quite common in, in bitches that have been spayed. Um, there, is, there are various good treatments available which your vet will be able to prescribe to you. The important thing is, to be honest, is, is to go and see your vet with this, um, just to be sure that we are dealing with a, a simple urinary incontinence problems and not something more serious. So the vet would more likely want to just take a urine sample um, and uh, look at it under a microscope, as well as to um, to try and grow any bacteria, just to make sure that there's no actual background uh, uh, urinary infection that could be the cause of this. Um, but rest assured, this is relatively common. Once your vet has been able to rule out the common causes, except urinary incontinence associated with spaying, then normally it's a it's a simple process of starting on one of these tablets. And uh, once the dose has been reached, um, then what we generally try, try and do is then reduce the dose to such an extent that you keep the minimum effective dose. And in our experience, most dogs in these conditions, with these kind of conditions, end up being very, very nicely treated on a tablet or maybe two tablets on a weekly basis, depending on the weight of the dog. Mm -hmm. um, but I would really recommend you see the effect first on this, just to be clear that we are dealing with a, a urethral incompetence of the bladder rather than anything else more sinister. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, our next question is from Linda on Facebook. My spring spaniel loves water but also suffers with ear infections. I don't want to stop my dog from swimming but also want to take necessary precautions to reduce the chance of getting infections. Any <laughs> Very cool and bubble, yep. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> ear infections, especially in the floppy ear dogs. Yeah, for some reason, like floppy ear dogs in water tend to go more than the straight ear dogs in water. Um, floppy dogs are a pro floppy ears, of course, are a problem because they're floppy. So, as you as your daddy know, the water gets inside the ear canal. Uh, the ear goes flat and that just causes heat and obviously increases the humidity within there and guess yeah. what, humidity and heat are the two things that bacteria love. And yeast, sorry of course, yeah. and yeast <laughs> love. Um, the easiest thing with this of course is prevention. Um, we really don't want to stop your dog getting into the water and spring up, it's what it wants to do. Um, so the key with this is to keep the, the ear uh, um, dry and uh, and well, dry dry and clean, of course. So, what we would normally recommend is fundamentally using a, a ear cleanser, um, and there's a, quite a few on the market now. Um, the two we would recommend is one called Sturisol um, or um, Epiotic. Um, but the key, to be honest, is the is the ear cleansing itself, yeah. which can be quite tricky. So ear canals and dogs have um, an L shape. So you can imagine if you put your finger in, it kind of gets stuck all the way at the where the junction is of the of the L. So what you need to do, and normally the best thing for this is be, once again for your vet to show you once or twice how to do it properly. Because once you know how to do it properly, it's, it's actually quite easy to prevent. Mm -hmm. um, but the key is to keep the ear canal straight, put in the, the cleanser, so that you so it goes to the bottom of the of the ear itself, and then you've got to massage the base of the ear, and you normally massage it until you hear the, the, the squishy sound, which you know you've got it in the right place. And to be honest, you'll know whether you've got it in the right place because your dog will normally start doing this and <laughs> leaning towards you or <laughs> doing this with its leg. Um, it's like yes, you've got the spot. Um, and then what normally we recommend after you've done that for a few seconds and she, she or he's really happy with it, then you, um, uh, what I tend to recommend is using eye makeup remover pads. Um, mainly because the cotton 
is, is sandwiched between two layers which do not allow the cotton to then remain in the ear canal. You put this around your, your finger like this, you lift the ear canal, you put your, your, your the dog's ear, and you in one fell swoop, then lift it up. Look, easier said than done, especially like this. Um, the best thing, honestly, is get your vet to show you how to do it properly. Um, and then you prevent it, and, and then your dog can continue swimming and, um, and be a happy little, little, little fella. And if you're doing it regularly, then you're not getting to the point where the dog gets infected and painful, yes. um, and then it's more of an enjoyable experience for both of you. Yeah. So we'd probably say once every week to once every two weeks is ideal sort of um, frequency. Correct. Um, and really, the, the thing that you're doing by using a proper commercial air cleaner is that you're cutting through all the wax and, mm. and all the, the grease and, um, and helping that to remove itself from the air. So it's really important to get a proper, a proper air cleaner. Correct. And if you see the vet the first time, he or she may see that there is a, maybe a primary like, initial infection which could have caused the problem initially and may require a short-term antibiotics prior to getting the whole like, in conjunction with doing the air cleansing. Mm -hmm. um, once you get over that stage, then as Emma says, it's, it's nice and easy prevention and it's a lot easier cleaning a dog's ear <laughs> when it's not infected than when it is infected. So if it's yelping and it's feeling in pain when you get close to that ear, and specifically if it smells bad, your nose is the best thing to be honest, um, then it probably does require some, some more advanced treatment, let's call it, prior to doing a normal preventative uh, regime. Thank you. Um, our next question. Um, my dog has a flea infestation. What is the best thing I should do? Wow. Another yeah. common one. <laughs> Another common one. Go on, get them. You start. You um, start. Okay, so the thing about flea infestations is A, they're extremely infuriating for everybody, um, animal and owner, and vet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and two is that the majority of the problem is not actually on your animal, it is on the environment that the animal lives in. So we, we generally talk about having a 5% of the problem on the animal and 95% in the environment. And what that means is that you've got adult fleas living on the animal, as you know, fleas um, live off blood, so they're having a nice time on the animal, picnicking away, um, <laughs> biting your, your cat or dog, making them itch, and, and causing all those sorts of problems, but in the meantime you've got the whole other life cycle in the environment. So you've got your fleas laying eggs which are shiny and round and slippery and they then slip off the animal onto the carpet, they roll under the couch, they go into the crevices, um, the eggs hatch into larvae uh, which then kind of do their little larval crawling disgusting thing um, and they form a, a cocoon after that and then they pupae. Um, the thing about the pupae is that they're very, very hard to kill. Yep. So we've got our adult fleas on the animal that we can kill using lots and lots of things that are on the market, spot ons and tablets and all sorts of things. Um, then you've got your larvae in the environment which you can actually kill using an environmental spray mm -hmm. but unfortunately the pupae um, are going to be there until they hatch into adult fleas. So, the whole moral of that big long story is that it takes quite a while to get on top of a flea infestation because you've got to wait for that life cycle to um, to wear itself out basically for all those people to become adults yeah. so you can kill them all. Uh, so How long does that take you think Emma in order to go through that whole life cycle? Yeah so really I mean you're looking at probably a minimum of three months mm -hmm. of regular frequent treatment so mm -hmm. You've got to remember you've got to be treating your animals with a spot on monthly if you've got a flea infestation. So um, the other very important thing to remember is to treat all the animals in the house at the same time. So yeah. um, if you've got um, cats, dogs, rabbits, if you're treating a rabbit, make sure that you're using the appropriate treatment, obviously. Um, treat them all at the same time monthly, good quality stuff, and use your sprays for the environment. Um, you know, if it's really severe, you might want to go, there are some products that are available in prescriptions, you might want to see your vet. But in general, you just have to be patient that three months, and then after that, continue your regular treatment, but by then you're on top of your environmental uh, problem, mm -hmm. so to speak. 
The key is persevere. <laughs> Don't give up. Um, it is tricky, especially if you've got a lot of fleas initially. Um, but yes, just don't give up. Yeah. Just don't give up. Um, I mean, look, worst, worst, worst case with these sort of stages, you can actually move out of your house for two or three days, and you can get professional companies to come in and what's called fee bomb the place. Um, that's kind of a last resort measure, um, but can work in cases where you really are not winning. And normally, when you're not winning, it's because you're getting an external source of infection that keeps on coming into your house, mm -hmm. that keeps on recreating the cycle that end of the run. And then you need to still got your pupae as well catching. So, <coughs> so your pupae catch from vibration and heat and carbon di uh, carbon dioxide. So, mm -hmm. um, you do have to in a way uh, sacrifice the animals a little bit because you have to get the animals to walk around and get the fleas to hatch. Yeah. So unfortunately, you know, you do have a bit of um, uncomfortable irritation for a few months while the fleas are, are kind of getting their life cycle um, out of the way. Now I don't know if it's you just moved into a new house, but a lot of the time when, a new, when you, someone moves into a new house, um, Especially if they haven't been pets there for a while, but they were pets there beforehand, and you come in with a pet. Mm -hmm. The actual pet itself moving into the house, specifically the carbon dioxide being emitted from the pet, is enough for those pupae to start reacting mm -hmm. um, and then turning into adults and then jump onto your, onto your dog or, or cat, actually. Or um, yourself. Or, your, or, your, or yourself, <laughs> and then you get the lines around the ankles and the little so, red yeah. spots um, and, uh, and so forth. So, yeah, um, so frustrating. Very um, frustrating. Yeah. But, but doable. Doable. And then if you if you keep up your flea treatment, then you don't end up with your own fixation again. You can <coughs> prevent rather than uh, rather than treat, which is always better. Great. Thank you very much. Um, next question is from Susan Smith. I have a one-year-old long-legged Staffordshire um, terrier. She is quite a stressy dog who on occasion has acted quite odd in the middle of the night walking in circles and wandering aimlessly. She's had a fit three weeks ago in the last, lasting 10 minutes. Any help? Okay. Uh, the fit thing seems to be the most uh, the most uh, striking thing about this in a, in a young dog. Um, by the sounds of it, she has had some, can you give a slight description of what I guess, slight, looks like she's had a, a degree of a, of, a, of a seizure, let's call it. Um, which in young dogs actually can be quite common. Um, I would say the most urgent thing for you to do right now is to actually go to see your vet. Um, ideally, if she has fitted again since that time that we've written this question, but at least to start documenting how long she's fitting. Generally, a fitting cycle goes through three phases. Um, most of the time, you won't catch all the three phases, but it's the fact. But it's important to to know how long each the actual duration of the bit that you are seeing is lasting. Um, like I said, uh, it seems to be some kind of, 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 of fitting history with this. As I said, it's hard to say because we're not your particular vet, but I would really advise to go see your vet and he or she needs to really just do a simple, well, do a, a urine analysis and actually a blood test just to make sure that they can rule out the most common causes of fits in dogs which uh, obviously within the brain or outside the brain. And in young dogs, it's highly unlikely that there's anything really sinister going on with a fitting dog, um, i.e. things like tumors are unlikely to be the cause because she's a very young dog. Um, but doing a blood test and the urine analysis will help the vet rule out the most common causes for, uh, for epilepsy. And if they've all been ruled out, then generally, um, it's what's called idiopathic epilepsy, which, to be honest, is just a fancy word for saying that all the common causes have been ruled out and they've been left with something which has no clear cause to it. The good news is that generally with young dogs, if they do have this problem, they tend to work themselves out of it. And in worst cases, if they don't work themselves out of it, there are very good treatments available for your animal, which will keep it uh, in a very good quality of life. Um, but we would really advise mm -hmm. to see your vet, especially if she's especially if she's only fitted once. So it's really good to, to get in there now, so that they can do some bloods, so they can have a, an idea of, of where to start benchmarking from. But please go see your vet. Yeah. And what I would suggest, just in the meantime, in between now and the appointment, if you see the aimless wandering mm -hmm. or a seizure, try and video it. Ah, yes. Quite well. yes, very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we have a question from Tom on Facebook. My dog is constantly scratching. We thought it was because of pollen, etc., but antihistamines don't work and he hasn't got fleas. Could it be a skin allergy? Yes, uh, it's, <laughs> it could be. It could be Tom. Uh, <laughs> It could, no, it could be. Look, I mean, uh, if it's excessively scratching, I mean, there are, there are various causes for it, but the most common one is obviously number one, back to fleas to a certain extent, especially if they're scratching at the base of the tail. The base of the tail is like the Kensington and Chelsea of the flea real estate on your dog, um, and um, that probably is you know, one of the most common one causes. Um, and it can be difficult to tell that your dog does have fleas sometimes. You, you may think that it doesn't, but it's just because fleas are very, very good at hiding from you for very fast. So. Yeah. Actually, a good trick for that, if you wish, is, is to make sure it's not fleas, because, you know, let's make sure it's not fleas before you do anything else, is uh, at where the dog is scratching, specifically, as I said, if it is around the base of the tail or the back end, is to get um, a brush and brush the, the, the brush your hair, brush their dog's hair, and then get some uh, moist paper. Put the put the, the the hair and any sort of flea dirt or dirt that you think is dirt onto the moist paper. Fold the moist paper over, and when you open it, if you see any tinging or pink tinging or slightly red tinging, that implies that it's flea dirt, i.e., digested blood. Um, if you do that and there's obviously nothing, yes, it could be a skin allergy. As I said we don't know the breed of the dog, we don't know the age of the dog, um, but uh, there are various things that your vet would want to rule out before going down the skin allergy track, because in order to diagnose the exact allergen causing the skin allergy, there are various tests that your vet would want to do um, in order to work out what exactly is the allergen causing the, 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 the issue. Um, but you do not want to go down that path um, prior to ruling out um, other causes of the simple of, things. Of the simple things. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Let's rule out the simple things first. Um, and and then look for the for the for the for the for the, for the zebras uh, later on, as per se. Great, okay, thank you. Um, got uh, another one here, perhaps more behavioural. But my dog is scared of thunder and fireworks and begins to visibly shake and tries to hide under things. Is there anything I can do to keep him calm and feel safe? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's it. It's a good question. Um, and quite a common problem as well. Um, so there's a couple of things to it. One is behavioural. Um, it's important when a dog is acting fearful that you don't inadvertently reward that behaviour. So what a lot of people do when the dog starts shaking and, and whining is that they'll go and comfort the dog and, and stroke the dog, caress the dog and speak soothingly to the dog. And then the dog thinks this is great. <laughs> and actually, um, May, may tend to behave that way in the future because it knows what, what's going to happen after that. So the most important thing to do in that situation is actually just sort of remain calm, don't treat the dog like there's anything um, there to be molecules over, to yeah. Yeah. Um, but just to, to be sort of calm and, and just um, no, no caressing or, or anything like that, just, just to kind of um, act like nothing's going on really. Um, close the curtains, all that sort of uh, quite obvious. Yeah, that's a good CD, that's a good uh, desensitization, desensitization mm -hmm. CDs, uh, yeah, which so mimic the sound of thunder. And the idea lighting. between that is to kind of start things off in low volume, yep. um, keep going along every day, every day life, so the dog gets used to these things going on, and then gradually increase the volume until you're at the point where. Um, it would be the volume that the dog might experience when thunderstorm or fireworks are going on, um, and then the dog is, is quite used to it. So, so that's another thing. Um, providing a den for the dog to go into, so maybe a covered crate with a nice, comfy bed and all the things that the dog likes, so the dog can go in there and be safe and secure. Um, and the other thing is that you can actually get some really, really useful supplements and some useful um, pheromone therapy that can actually help the dog feel really comfortable. So one of them is, um, for example, Zilkeen. It's a, a natural um, supplement derived from milk protein. So it kind of mimics the um, what the dog would get when it was a puppy suckling off its mother's, um, mother's milk. 
and it makes the dog feel comfortable, um, decreases anxiety levels and stress levels, and it just helps helps it feel generally more calm. And the other thing is um, it's also related to, to nursing puppies, and that's the pheromone that the mother dog releases when the puppies are nursing. Um, they've actually made a synthetic version of that called Adaptil, and you can get that in lots of different forms. So you've got yeah. a spray that you can spray around the, the area <coughs> that the, the dog um, sleeps in. You've also got a room diffuser, so it can actually uh, diffuse throughout the whole room, and, um, and a collar. So the, if the dog wears the collar, then um, the pheromones are constantly around the dog, which is, is often a good thing as well. So um, yeah. all of those things are really, really useful. Yeah, no, they work really well. The, the, the pheromones, the adaptor that we were talking about, can be very useful. In our experience, it works really well in about 40 to 50% of cases. The important thing about the, the, the pheromones is if you do buy the plugins, is to read the instructions. <laughs> Um, each plug-in only does about 50 square meters on a house. Um, so what generally people do is buy it and then don't buy enough of them or leave the windows open the whole time and then say it doesn't work. It's really important that you follow the directions carefully and it's really important that you give it at least four weeks trial before deciding it doesn't work. Bear in mind also we're getting close to October and firework season so it's probably worth starting with yeah, this now so especially with the desensitization sounds um, and finding the den, so giving your dog a, a nice safe area that they can go to um, and slowly you know, build up their confidence so that by the time the fireworks season starts, um, you're in a lot more control. Um, when we see it as vets, we see a lot of clients coming to us a week before fireworks. The night want, before. <laughs> the night before fireworks, they want an overnight solution. Please don't do that. No. Start now. Um, you've got plenty of time. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And even if you did want to go to your vet and you get some sort of sedative or anything like that, it's not the best solution at all. No. It's not a good solution. No. So being prepared is, is definitely a good way to go. Correct. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I've got a question from David. He purchased a fantastic Bordeaux from um, Preloved. He's incredible. He's now two and a half years old, fit and strong, but as recently he has become incontinent of urine, dribbling when quiet. Is it a common problem, and what might be done to help? Ooh. Well, it's, it's not as common in male dogs no. as it is in female dogs. We were talking before about the female. Uh, of that. Uh, yeah, urinary incontinence. So female dogs normally get it because they've been spayed or desexed. We don't know if your dog has been castrated or or, or, or not. Um, I would assume probably not in this in this case. Um, there are there are other causes of male urinary incontinence, um, which can be which can be numerous. Um, the to be honest, the best thing with this is I mean it seems like your dog's not really disturbed by it. It does seem to be he seems to be unaware of it. It does seem to be a, a true case of urinary incontinence. But to be like we were talking beforehand, it's important to do the urinalysis and also bloods to be honest in this case um, in order to rule out. Um, other causes such as well, such as ectopic ureters, such as um, such as potentially hip problems, uh, to ensure that that incontinence is not caused by one of those problems. It doesn't seem it, um, but I uh, would recommend in this case to 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 go see your vet. Um, and if it is a case of male urinary incontinence, then there are various um, good treatments available that your vet will be able to prescribe. Great, thank you. Um, got a question from Alan. My border colleague Jessie, she's five years old, she's had eight pups last year and she has never lost the weight since. She drinks constantly and is hungry all the time but is very active. What should I do to try and help her lose weight? Okay. Um, the two things that strike me with this is that she was obviously pregnant with, with eight pups. A uh, fair amount of pups, to be honest. Back in October, we're now July, nine months old. Obviously, not directly related to any sort of lactation or anything like that. But she has gone through a, a stressful period. Her body has gone through a stressful period. So that's sort of the point one. And the second two points that you mentioned, which rings bells in our ears, is that she's drinking a lot and she's eating a lot. Um, those would be the two things I would want to look at first. Um, there are 
simple ways to look at, see how much your dog is drinking to see if it's normal or abnormal. Um, to be technical, a normal dog will drink between 60 to 80 mils per kilogram per day of water. Um, that's kind of step one to find out if your dog is drinking more than usual. So the easiest thing to do with that is to get in a bowl, um, pour in a fixed amount of water from a jug so you know exactly how much has been put in. Put it in and over a period of 25, 24 hours um, measure what has been drunk. You know the weight of the dog um, and then see if your dog falls within that 60 to 80 mils of water per kilogram per day. If they're outside of that, i.e. more than that, then it could imply um, potentially a metabolic problem. And there's one or two problems or metabolic issues that could be linked to her being pregnant eight or nine months ago that has stressed her out, that has pushed her into this, uh, into this extra condition. Um, hard to say, as I said, we don't have blood tests, we're not seeing your animal here. But the fact that she's drinking more and eating more would imply that potentially there is a metabolic issue going on here. So to be honest, in this case, please see the vet. Um, um, and ideally, if you can, do the water consumption so that you have that with you. But if you can't do it, don't worry. Just go, go and see a vet straight away. There are various blood and urine tests which they would want to, to do on her uh, to, to, to work out what, what is going on. And as a general point, so um, there are various options. If, you, if you're finding that it's a struggle to, to go to the vet or to pay vet bills, um, don't forget about the charities that are available. So you've got your PDSA, you've got your Blue Cross. Um, there's a various charities and trusts across the country um, that will actually help you out with all, all this um, veterinary-related um, things that you need to do. So, you know, and it is important, obviously, because you want her to be well. So yeah. you can do a little Google search or... Yeah, the PDSA, the PDSA have good many branches. We both worked at the PDSA in the past and they do a really good job. Um, they're much cheaper than, 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 than everyday vets in that respect. Um, you have to show that you're on some kind of benefit um, in order to apply or to be eligible, uh, eligible for it. Mm -hmm. But um, please go see your vet on this one. Um, the excessive drinking and eating needs to be looked at. Great, thank you. Um, got a question from Karen. It's a very broad question. What is the best way to stop my two dogs barking? <laughs> She's not giving any more. At each other? At other people? She's away. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. It's a, yeah, that, I mean, that's a behavioural issue. It um, is. It is. There are various things that you can that you can try, um, but it depends on how much time you have, how often you're there with the dogs. Mm -hmm. um, for example, you can, um, one, one good way to do it is to use a distraction technique. So you get a, um, maybe a jar full of stones, for example. Mm -hmm. The minute the dog opens his mouth to start barking, you shake the stones. When the dog stops barking because it's distracted, then you actually give it a reward. So you praise the dog for, for not barking. So it's, it does rely on you being there um, to be able to do that because obviously you need to be consistent when you're trying to reinforce behaviour. Um, but it's really, just, you can't really do it the other way. You can't really punish the dog for barking because it's. Um, well, they won't understand it. They won't understand. It's a natural behaviour, and, and the, it might make them even more upset. More likely, about more likely, yeah, but some, sometimes, yeah, getting upset with dogs, they, they spin it the other way around, and they see that as a reward. And yeah. sometimes that makes them happy even worse. It's hard to know. It seems to be. Yeah, I don't know. We don't know if they're barking at each other. We don't know if it's under the night. We don't know if it's maybe an attention deficit thing going on. I mean, when someone's leaving the house and they're left alone, and there's an issue there. We don't know if they've got access to the outside. You know, whether they're inside or they. Uh, obviously, we've got to make sure that they're exercised a lot. Um, it is a general question, but I understand your frustration. Um, but yeah, definitely making sure they're tired by making sure they're getting enough exercise during the day. Even the things that we were talking about before, the zilking, the adaptive, that can yep. really help with dogs that are barking because they're anxious, because they've got separation anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, all those sorts of issues can be 
you know, those those sorts of supplements and, and things can be really, really helpful. Yeah. Great, okay. I think we'll have time for just one more. Okay. Um, so it's from Sandy. Hi, my dog Molly, who is five years old, has some discharge coming from her eyes. She keeps licking her leg and rubbing them. <laughs> so she's itch, got itchy eyes and she's licking her leg. So or is she rubbing her eye against her Or is she, yeah, that was the, yeah. She's licking her leg and rubbing her, so I think she's using it to clean her Ah, eyes. okay, okay. Uh, right, well, yellow discharge from the eye, and with some kind of infection is going on. Um, or they're dry. Or they're dry, yes, um, with a, yeah, with a secondary infection. I don't, it's hard to know, we can't see the eye, of course, because it would be nice to know if there's a level of, of conjunctivitis associated with it, spiritus. Um, the honest thing is that it probably does need an eye exam. Um, anything from an ulcerated cornea can cause this uh, to, to, yeah, to just a simple infection that's gotten out of control. Um, I, do we need to know the breed of dog on this one? Um, she's not so fat. Not so Just five no. years old. Five situation. years old. Some dogs can have a predisposition to having eye infections depending on, on how the the, mm. the eye, the, you know, the, the eyelid is shaped. There are some dogs that have, um, can have the eyelids flipping on, on, side, on top of the cornea. Um, which can be actually quite common mm -hmm. in some breeds of dog. And Even just here coming from the face and rubbing yeah. the eyes in some breeds of dogs. So. Correct, correct. So it's hard to know how long it's been going on for, but yeah, I, yeah, go, go see a vet. I, he or she should, should be able to do a fairly quick visual exam. They may put in some dye in your dog's ear, just dog's ear, dog's <laughs> eye, sorry, uh, to see if there's, a, if there's an ulcer present. Um, but yes, I would, I would see a vet on this one. The yeah. thing with eyes is that you don't want to muck around with yeah. eyes. Just, no. um, just get them seen too, because there's all sorts of problems that can that can occur from leaving things like that too long. So. Yeah. 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 So yes, please see a vet on this one. Great. Okay. Um, and that's it. I think we'll call it a day there. Um, try and scooch over. Yeah. Um, thank you for. <coughs> watching and um, we're going to try you. and do a few more and um, so just keep an eye out on our social accounts and um, on the blog and we'll let you know uh, but thank you very much for your Pleasure. time and it was fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you enjoyed it <laughs> yeah. and um, so thank you very much okay thank you, thank you.